Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast. My name is Debbie from NDIS Property Australia and welcome to our monthly in-depth series, SDA Unlocked, where we delve into the supply and demand data for specialist disability accommodation in different areas around Australia. Today, I am very excited because we have a couple of guest speakers here with us to discuss the SDA supply and demand in Perth. And these speakers are Matt and Dan from Everhomes. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Great. Yeah, fantastic to have you in the office and to talk about something which I know uh, you spend a lot of time looking at the data uh, in different areas around Australia. So, yeah, um, helping me out a lot because there's only so much I can determine from the information I get from the NDIA. And I know that you guys have access to to far more resources to be able to give us some more real in-depth information. So once again, thank you for coming in today to do this. And uh, Perth, let's get started. Um, I guess, do you want to maybe first talk about how you uh, look at the data and um, and why? Sure. Well, I'll start with that, that um, by Dan here. Um, so I um, think we're just probably a bit more nerdy uh, yeah. than others. So <laughs> we like going in depth and, and trying to analyze what's going on uh, because we're, we're just SDA providers. Uh, we're also interested in not oversupplying certain markets and knowing that we can service certain areas. Um, so that's been an approach for us for, for a long time um, in looking at that. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that, Matt? No, no, it's really just breaking down all the available data we can get just through boring maths and, yeah, being nerdy, breaking it down as, as far as possible, really. Yeah, finding the gaps and, like, adding in those contextual factors that we're aware of as SDA providers as well. Yeah. Great. Okay, so, Perth, tell us what you know. Right. Do you want me to go first, Matt? Yeah, take it away. All right. So, Matt uh, probably spends a bit more time looking at it, so I'll, I'll throw to him um when necessary but so essentially uh perth is comprised of four main regions but there are there are also two other regions um and these are all statistical regions uh sa4 um and the the two additional areas which are approximating the perth are bunbury and mandura and we have sorry Five Perth areas: Perth Inner, Perth Northeast, Perth Northwest, Perth Southeast, and Perth Southwest. And this actually makes up the majority of Western Australia. If obviously that's where the population distribution is, um, and so to put some context here, Perth was the last place for the NDOs to roll out, and so we've seen that uh, things have progressed differently in Western Australia as a result of that. Um, some of the key takeaways that we've gotten from looking at the Perth data um, are associated with government initiatives that have, have been in place, um, which are wonderful initiatives and in association with public housing. So in, uh, in Perth, they have a community disability housing program and then we're still trying to work out how that actually represents in the data, whether it is represented in the data as SDA, that they are providing accessible housing through this program and have proved that in SCI. Yeah, they're trying to keep it away from, I guess, privatising disability housing wholly. So they've, they're turning what was this old government-style disability housing into what we think is being classified as the new build in the data. Um, so we think they're shifting it 
rather than building new stuff okay. like you see in Brisbane um, and New South Wales and things like that. That's very interesting. Yes. It is a guess. Yeah. It's based on their, I've done some research into their um, 2020 to 2030 housing strategy, so the disability strategic plan. And that's the indication we're getting is that they don't want to fully privatize uh, disability housing. They want to keep it in-house, I assume, because they don't want to lose um, the stock that they produced under their scheme. Um, so they are making, they're either getting some accommodations to um, pass as SDA or they're doing a completely different thing um, to sort of classify them as new people. Or if, yeah, all people, so there are people, many people registered with the SDA funding. In Western Australia, you can see that um, has seen for many years now, particularly in the more central areas in Perth, that they um, have a very high percentage um, of people in, uh, I think it's Perth, North, South, West and East, and probably inner, um, compared to other areas. And we think that's associated with that, that program. But what you see and have seen for a long time, is much lower levels of people seeking SDA in those places because of their current housing situation. Okay. So if you compare that to somewhere like Queensland, where it was obviously where we're based, um, that's that's the key difference here um, is that those numbers seeking are always growing. Uh, we've, we've got, um, uh, can you hear that? Where's the number there, Matt? Um, of the percentage of, of growth, I think it's quite consistent. We, yeah, we, uh, percentage of, you got an average of about 6% growth per quarter in participants with funding in Perth, generally, and that's a high amount seeking in those inner areas, um, and even a little bit of Mandura, which is further out. Um, but it's growing quite rapidly, so it's, it, it equates to about 81 new participants per quarter. Yeah. Um, so there's the growth there, but what they're doing is they might be afford- getting afforded SDA funding, but not in particular seeking that new build. Stock. Because they're already living in something that's actually working for Or it's them. already available for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Having said that, I remember looking, you know, two years ago and the numbers that they're seeking now are much higher than they were. We we're looking at a very high numbers and that was part of transition to the NDIS. It's very new for everybody concerned. And as the... As I'm assuming many people know that listen to this podcast, you have to go through an application process to be able to actually get SCA funding, and that can take quite a, a long period of time. So, as things roll out, you know, we it is actually a, a process of a year or two before you actually start seeing that person represented in the data. Yeah. So, what we're seeing coming through now is a product of you know something put in motion a year to eighteen months ago, um, but. Yeah, some of the some of the trends I think in terms of the housing that we noticed is there's a really a high number of apartments going in. Um, we're not sure if that is part of that government stop or not. Is um, in terms of the the pipeline, there's 111 one resident apartments coming through and 63 new builds that currently exist just for one residence. Okay, and there are lots of one resident options uh, in. Uh, in Perth or around Perth, particularly focused on the northeast, southwest um, areas. In terms of gaps in the market, what we noticed, and obviously this, this is at the time of us getting this December data and was shown the other time, that there are not many two resident houses built. Uh, I think 23 in development. Um, so it's starting to pick up. And which area is this? So I've got a house, one house, with new build funding in Perth North East in the fully accessible Cali Brew. And nothing in, in Robust. Um, two in Hypes and Support. And we know from our work in other areas that two resident houses are obviously something that people seek, something that families might need if they want to live in a house together provided the investors willing to, to make that work. Um, and so we would think that there's probably a gap there for that sort of development. So this is Perth North East? Perth North East has two. Perth, Perth area like has a shame. And Perth South East has 
one in a high physical support category that's currently built. There are 23 in development though. So Matt has those. He can talk to. Yeah, that's only. So Northeast in particular, there's only one um, two resident house being built. Uh, there's five being built in northwest, nine being built in southeast, six being built in southwest, and it's a generally low uptake. Um, you look at free resident houses, there's quite a few more coming through, um, but by far and large, one resident apartments are still being built in the pipeline. Um, again, obviously chasing those higher returns, but it might not be uh, what participants are seeking in particular. Because um, we've also identified that improvability seems to be what people are seeking the most. Um, obviously, these apartments often get built to the high fiscal support standard. Um, so there may be a gap, yeah, definitely for those two resident houses. Two resident houses, improved ability. Well, building to the high physical support, and then you can accommodate you your can IL, still accommodate fully accessible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, if the investor's willing to take that lower income. Yes. So... Yeah, so I mean, I'm obviously we're conscious. Hopefully, people don't that are listening to this podcast don't all go out and build exactly the same thing. <laughs> but we're just reporting on um, where the kind of the gaps are. We also don't have data on exactly who is getting funded for what. Yeah, and this is a big gap in the data overall right. for SDA in Australia. Is we we can't get that information, mm. and it. it it, it could be released. It could be, yeah, but it would be helpful if it was. Um, but there is um, there is anecdotal kind of evidence that we had through our work. And so we know that two resident, three resident house funding is quite common. And logically, the economics of it, the government is wanting for that so they shared housing option this to be put out as the, you know, the first option and, and less likely to dish out the apartment funding. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's probably, in terms of what's being funded, there's probably a case for uh, two resident houses and perhaps some more three resident houses, yeah. particularly in those lower funded category. And so that's pretty much in in all the main areas in Perth, in all the SA4 locations. Follows the same trend. Um, the only, if you look at it from a oversupply versus undersupply, I guess, lens um, everywhere. And, you, and if you count stockers' bedrooms, so available bedrooms, yeah. Christmas to move in, um, there's a shortage in every area, every statistical four area in Western Australia, except for Mandura, which is slightly over. I think there's an oversupply of about 20 bedrooms. Okay. So you're at equilibrium there anyway. That's, you know, you accommodate for new participants coming through. That'll most likely even out. So basically, yeah, don't necessarily build anything new in Mandura no, well, at the moment. Your- I, I would assume it's uh, cheaper land prices out there. Yeah. Things like that. Um, and obviously, it follows the same trend for anywhere in Australia. The closer you get to a central business district is where the lack of SDA is. Mm-hmm. Also, where the highest need can also be sometimes as well. Yeah. So, it's a catch-22 in that regard. Um, but general investment into the area, if you just look at it from the numbers, it's good. Um, but again, it comes down to specifically what you want to build and the availability of funding there. Um, and that's where we believe that the house options are probably a little bit more uh, beneficial to participants, definitely. Yeah. So pretty much any – is there anywhere in the, those Perth areas that you see some oversupply of houses? Or not of really, houses. Not of houses at no. all. So no. that's really needed everywhere. Yeah. And you said in some of those areas there's no robust at all? Um, robust is a bit – Tricky. I know there isn't. If you're looking at it from places, there's barely any robust bedrooms available. Um, but in saying that, there's not many seeking robust. Right. Um, you can accommodate for potential future growths. Um, obviously, robust is a niche market within an already niche market. Yes. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity there if you build the right thing. Probably one resident villa type thing. I would say, I don't know. Again, Matt's got the sand seeding in front of him. I've got the already built stock in front of me, there's basically nothing currently built. Yeah. And there are definitely people that need robust housing. Um, so I would certainly encourage some investors to do that, or to look at. Or to look into hybrid designs. Well, the thing about robust is you could, uh, you could house people with improved with a build. You can, that's right. That's true. Yes. So, Which, yeah. 
you wouldn't want to match really robust with improved ability. No. The worst case scenario, you could put two people with improved ability, ability in a three-bedroom robust home. Yes. And we would always recommend one or two beers don't for us. Awesome. Absolutely. Our preferences is typically. For a single, yeah. Yeah, we've been told by many different organisations that probably 80% of robust participants cannot share. So, yeah, really that one tenant um, properties are needed. And uh, I guess that is something that we're all hoping to see with the new price um, prices released to be implemented 1st of July is that there may be a one-tenant house funding. I'm very much hoping for that. There are situations in which we can use Appendix G, which I've spoken about previously on this board. Yeah, we have family members. Family members. But in some cases that doesn't work and we've been told, hey, this person absolutely needs the space of a house um, and they're not living with a fan. Yeah. And there does need to be some sort of... Um, Way to account for for that situation. Yeah, but until we know that information, I guess um, to sum up Western Australia supply and demand, we know there is some supply. I just wanted to touch base on what you were talking about with the existing supply already. Um, I don't see that as really being reflected at all in the supply stats put out by the NDIA. What I'm looking at in all of Perth is eleven existing or legacy dwellings. Yeah, it's definitely not, it's not being really out of existing stock. Yeah. We're, we're still debating about what is actually where that's based on the sort of sense of our shit. Maybe there's a mixture. Yeah. Of some that is in the dust. I think that they are turning that old government, what we would define in Queensland as existing stock, they've been able to shift it to new build. Somehow maybe doing some refurbs. Because the amount of new build stock there is quite high. It's high. Um, and the pipeline stock is also high, and it doesn't follow the same trend as other areas where you would have seen a really high amount of existing stock getting gradually phased out, new build coming in, and then pipeline coming in as well. Um, the new build just happens to be there. Um, so we think they're not actually being built. They were built a while ago, and it's just been They somehow managed to get them. Yeah. But we're just... Respect. We're not in Western Australia right now. There would be people that obviously know exactly what's going on would welcome them to talk Yeah. To well, I'm actually, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually going to be in Perth um, later this week for an SDA conference there. So I will, I will do my best to get more on the ground intel <laughs> around that because it is a very interesting subject and it is unique to Western Australia for sure. So we, we know that there is, um, there's good supply. Of what type, we're not really sure, but it, it does exist. But there's still definitely an undersupply. And as you said, in two tenant houses, pretty much anywhere in Perth. Yeah. So, and yeah. the way we like to look at, I guess, your oversupply and undersupplies is again through looking at it as a bedroom and um, places. And what we find beneficial is to look at the market less existing stock. Because um, that existing stock is where participants are moving out of and it's where it's gradually getting phased out. So once you accommodate for no existing stock in the area, um, the shortages blow out massively. You know, for example, in um, Perth Northeast, you have a shortage of 240 bedrooms compared to participants in Perth um, Northwest, you have a shortage of 263. Whereas if you accommodated for existing stock, the shortage would only be 100. So it changes based on how you look at it. Um, and if you have the foresight to understand that that existing stock is going to phase out, participants aren't looking for that and they want to look for new build stuff, that's where you can get, I guess, you can figure out the areas where you're going to yield the, high, the highest returns in terms of placing participants anyway. Um, and again, then you whittle it down to house type and we think, yeah, the two-bedroom house is probably the most viable option. I guess, I mean, we, we love Western Australia in terms of the stock that we sell. We've got quite a lot happening over there, all house and land. Um, we, we do have some apartments that come on from time to time, uh, but the majority is definitely houses, two tenant houses. So I guess we are already um, listening to the to the data out there. Our builders are on top of it. They know what 
the demand is for. So that's a good thing. Um, but Western Australia is still new. I think it was the end of 2021 that Western Australia was fully implemented in, in the SDA system. So it's only been going a bit over a year now, fully. A uh, long way to go before they catch up to the eastern states and before, I guess, all the data is is being accurately um, put out there by the NDIA and other sources. So anything more to add on that, Matt and Dan? Nope. <laughs> I think that was very helpful, um, particularly for our investors that are looking at Western Australia as a potential area to invest in for SDA. So thank you so much for coming in today and, and helping us out with our SDA Unlocked episode on Perth. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.